Hey folks, today I've got a complete beginner's guide, tutorial, user interface guide, whatever you want to call it, on the Garmin 400 255. Now I've been using this watch for quite a while, so I've got plenty of data on it, both comparison data, but also more usage data. And I'm going to walk you through all the tips and tricks on this watch. Now you'll see YouTube chapters along the bottom there for all the different sections of this video in case you want to skip ahead to the section you're most interested. Essentially though, we're going to start off with the basics and get more and more complex as we go throughout the entire video, diving into things like training status and the new HRV features and, and all that kind of goodness. And in some cases, they'll even talk about comparisons with the Garmin 400 955 on where those features might differ a little bit. And a quick note, this video is sponsored by SteadyRack, more about them later on. So with that, let's start off with some of the basics. Uh, the first thing here to know is there's actually two different versions of the 255. Uh, there's a smaller one and a larger one, and even within that, there's also two different versions of each one of those, one with music and one without music. So the larger one is a 46 millimeter versus the smaller one is a 42 millimeter. In this case, I've got the 46 millimeter. Now diving right into it, this is not a touchscreen display. In fact, it's all buttons all the time. So you've got three buttons on the left-hand side and then two more buttons on the right-hand side. In general, the upper right-hand button is your stop, start, confirmation, everything kind of just go forward button. And this down here is your back button, your escape button. You've got up and down right there, and then a light up here as well as a quick access controls. So for example, I can hold this down for a quick second and get into these quick access controls. I can then press this to get back and I can go down through the widgets that we'll talk about in just a second. Flipping the watch over though briefly, you'll see there's the optical heart rate sensor right there. Uh, that will go ahead and measure your, just clean off that, looks, looks nicer, there we go. That goes in, you can see the green just turned on. That measures your heart rate as well as your blood oxygenation levels, uh, stress, like everything comes from this particular sensor right there. Uh, that's also the charging port. It's a standard Garmin charging port. And you can see right here, it is the music edition. So it has a storage space for music. There's no other functional differences between the two size watches or the music edition, except for the fact there's more storage in the music edition. And again, it can play music to your Bluetooth headphones. And it'll show how to download that music later on in the video towards the end there. Both editions do have Garmin Pay, so that is something that's new on the 255 compared to the 245. I mean, there's tons and tons of new stuff here we're gonna talk about, but there's no difference in terms of which models have Garmin Pay and don't. So as I noted here, this is your watch face. You can customize all the components on the watch face you want to. Just by pressing this middle button right there, you go into watch face. You can choose different default watch faces. You can see I'm just kind of sliding through some of these right here really quickly. I can also choose a given one and customize the components that are on that. So I can choose the different data pieces right there. So you can see there I can change the top one. Oops, there we go. I can change the top one there, uh, middle and so on. Each of the different components as I see fit. I'm gonna skate back out of this though. This is the one I like. Um, I've customized it to show my recovery time, my run time for the week. My, this today is Monday, so just reset today. My current VO2 max, as well as the time of day. And this is sunrise and sunset up at the top right there. I've also seen the battery and whether or not my phone is currently connected. If I go down once, these are the widgets. They're technically the widget glances because there's up to three of them per page. Uh, but I can tap into any one of these to get more information. Uh, so I can go right here and then just press this and it opens up this particular widget for my VO2 max. And it's going to show my running VO2 max. And if I tap this, I'll then see my cycling VO2 max. In the case of cycling, that does require a cycling power meter be connected. And that is something that Garmin 400 255 does support as part of some of the new sensors that it has or that allows you to connect to. Okay, actually, just a quick note before we go on to the next thing. If you are finding this video interesting or useful, if you could just simply whack that like button at the bottom there, it really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Clicking on back right here, uh, going through these, this is training status. We'll dive into each one of these in more detail. Uh, HRV status. Uh, this is the new race widget, uh, race calendar, and basically that drives daily suggested workouts for things like running. Uh, there's also the race calendar. We'll dive into that in more depth as well. Music controls for controlling not only music on the watch that you might load there, uh, but also music on your phone. Uh, notifications, weather, sleep. These are the uh, last seven days of workouts I've done here. So two runs, uh, one downhill ski. That's technically it was a water slide, but I couldn't figure out what to do. So I went with downhill skiing uh, and then a triathlon. It was a very easy week for me on vacation, mostly minus the race yesterday. Uh, and you can see the different sport profiles there as well as there's my heart rate and then steps. And again, if I just tap into steps, for example, you can see my steps throughout the day. And then my progress towards a goal up the top right there, that little arc over the top. Uh, right now, I'm only about a quarter of the way uh, into this kind of step goal for the day, but eventually I'll get there. I can then press down though to see other portions of this widget. So here's steps over the last uh, seven days. Here's my distance over the last seven days. And again, this is where you can see where you go from a widget glance that's back here into a widget that has multiple pages on it uh, and maybe more detail about those given components. And you go have many different pages on a widget glance if you wanted to. 
And then down here is pulse ox or blood oxygenation levels. This allows you to measure your blood oxygenation levels. There's really three different options here. One is on demand, which is what I prefer to keep it in. The second is to do it just at night while you sleep. And the third is to do it 24 by seven. Keep in mind, this is by far the biggest battery blowtorch you can possibly have on your Garmin watch. Uh, and so if you put it into that 24 by seven mode, you're only gonna get a handful of days of uh, pulse ox readings. Versus if you do it sleep, you'll get a handful more. Uh, but I prefer on demand because I just don't find a lot of value in this. Uh, this is something that you really have to know what you're doing and have to be able to control the variables in it. Uh, again, for high altitude stuff, or in some cases, some might want to look at it more for sleep uh, issues. But in this case, I just leave it as on demand, so I just control when that happens. And then this is the health snapshot. This allows you a bunch of health readings in kind of a one snapshot sort of time frame. I uh, mean, you can just sit down for two minutes, let it do its thing, and then it's done. And then you can export that out as a PDF for your doctor or whoever else you may want to send that to. Uh, this is useful because you can go ahead and control all those environmental variables. Variables. On the flip side, it's not as useful because some metrics are better just simply gathered while you're sleeping or throughout the day kind of on a 24-7 basis. Okay, so going back here, we can just press the back button right there, and we can dive into the settings that are holding down this middle left-hand button right there. And you can see there's our watch face, our alarm clock, uh, history, I can look at past activities, I can control settings for activities and apps and notifications and the wrist heart rate and sensors and music and connectivities and all these different options right here, uh, all in the settings. And what's cool about this though is on the 255, you can also control all these options from your phone as well. So you can control virtually everything on the 255, all the settings from your phone, something you didn't used to be able to do on Garmin watches until earlier this year with the Phoenix 7 and then the Epics and now the 955 and 255 and Instinct. Uh, and it's super powerful, especially if you come from the background of how you configure all of your data fields uh, on the watch itself, this is much easier to do. Now, speaking of things that you can also do from your phone is that you can use the Connect IQ app to go ahead and download watch faces uh, to the watch itself. So that allows you to download third-party watch faces from all sorts of developers out there, but also even make your own. Even if it's just simply sticking like your kid's picture on the watch or whatever you want it to be, you can do that pretty easily using the Connect IQ app. Uh, and that connects to this and just sends the things right into the watch itself. Super easy to do. That's also true of all other Connect IQ apps. So it's gonna be data fields or just straight up apps, things like Uber and United Airlines and all sorts of stuff like that that you can put on here, even like your Starbucks card if you want to. And then further, everything that you saw down here in the widgets goes to your phone on the Garmin Connect mobile app. So if I went down and saw, for example, sleep right there, and we cracked that open, uh, all this data is synced to my phone. You can see all that same information there as well. In fact, now's a good time to talk about some of these different metrics, and we'll start off with sleep. This will automatically track your sleep behind the scenes every single night. You just simply go to sleep and it does it for you. Uh, and you can see right here, if I go through the sleep pages, this is my hours of sleep. This is my sleep score, my quality is good. Uh, on some of these, I can tap in to get more information about it. Here's my sleep phases or sleep stages, if you will. I don't tend to put a ton of stock in this from really any wearable vendor. Uh, it's just not something that's super accurate. Even in the absolute best case, like almost medical-like conditions, uh, in terms of medical equipment, you're only getting like 80, 85% accuracy. Uh, and so that's really not that accurate compared to most other metrics that we might gather on our watches. Now, as noted earlier on, this video is sponsored by SteadyRack. Given you're watching a video about a sports watch, a multi-sport, watch in particular, it stands to reason you might have a bike or two taking up space in your home. The Steady Rack system allows you to store your bikes vertically against a wall, but also to pivot out of the way. Once installed, there's no need to lift your bike off the ground. You simply roll it up on its back wheel and then put it right into the track. The rack will do the lifting for you, cradling your bike by the front wheel, ensuring it's not being held by the frame, rim, or spokes so there's no damage concerns. They've got four different models from road bikes to mountain bikes to fat bikes. There's even a model for bikes with fenders, all holding up to 35 kilos or 77 pounds. The kicker here is that these racks pivot up to 160 degrees, which is essential since my hallway here in the cave doesn't actually have a ton of space. So this makes it perfect for me to line up nearly half a dozen bikes without blocking my hallway. About the only bike it doesn't work on besides my cargo bike is a Peloton bike back there in the corner. Well, I've got all sorts of crazy gear here in the DCR cave. This silly lineup of bikes has become like one of my favorite things here. It just works day in and day out. I don't have to think about it and the bikes are out of the way without taking much room up. You can find links to Steady Rack in the description below for more information. With that, back to the watch. If we go on down right here, you can see again, the sleep phases in a different kind of a chart there. And you can see my length of sleep is a bit shorter than recommended, but I had good REM sleep. Again, going back to some of the sleep phases there. And you can see here over the last seven days of my sleep, I was on vacation last week so I had lots of good sleep then and decreasing a little bit more here as I get back to kind of reality there and then here's my sleep score again over the last uh, week or so uh, this is the night before I raised here so it wasn't quite as good in that particular sleep uh, but overall relatively high sleep scores in the grand scheme of things again tapping back into this you can see that in the widget form right there and if I were to go down to 
some of those other metrics that I mentioned earlier, for example, heart rate up here, uh, you'll see right now, this would show my heart rate if I put it on my wrist. Of course, it's just measuring this block, so it's not gonna do much there. I can tap down, I can see my seven day uh, average resting heart rate. Uh, you can see it decreased quite a bit uh, last week, which is good, uh, down to about 45 or so. And I find my resting heart rate is a really good indicator of whether or not I might be getting sick or just too much going on in life. Uh, and as that spikes up again, that tells me maybe to slow down a bit more, take a bit more recovery rest. And that's something you'll probably also see from battery battery as well. So if I go back here, you'll see body battery right there. Right now it's not gonna give me an active reading because it's not on my wrist, but you can see my body battery over the course of the day. So going up to, uh, increasing as I slept up to 84 there, which is reasonably high out of 100. And then since midnight, it's gonna slowly decline there. Uh, and body battery is kind of like your Street Fighter style energy levels for just that one day and kind of reference in time. Uh, and I find it fairly accurate in terms of overall how I feel. It's a bit different than the Garmin training readiness that's on the 955 here, where that's showing you many more different components. In the case of the 955, for example, in training readiness, just to kind of illustrate this slightly here, I've worn these both watches at the same time. Now you can see training readiness has me at 70 right now. And what this has though is different components. So that's got sleep and recovery time from my last workout. That's got my HRV status as balance, my cute load, which is my last seven days of workouts, my sleep history and my stress history. Versus body battery is really just about kind of looking at you today and how stressed you are and what's going on in your life and then how well you slept last night and whether or not you got enough sleep. And so essentially they're kind of short term versus long term training. With body battery, it's more about like just your daily life versus training readiness is more about uh, the workouts and whether or not you're ready to train. Unfortunately, training readiness is only on the 955 and kind of higher end watches like the Phoenix 7 and Epics and other series like that. Uh, it's not on the 255, but just to kind of show you the difference between those two and how you might use them. So going back here, uh, let's look at HRV status, which is new on the uh, 955 and 255 at the same time. And you'll see it up here, up, 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 there we go. HRV status. So HRV status stands for heart rate variability status. And it's looking at your heart rate variability over time. So right now it shows me as balanced at 54 milliseconds. And each one of these different ranges right there is customized to me. So both, not just the values in both ends of those ranges, but how wide or how skinny those ranges are. So if I am like super consistent every single day during my sleep, uh, in terms of when it measures this, that green range might be actually a bit thinner. In my case, I'm a bit more variable. So that green area is kind of a bit wider because I tend to be more variable each night. Now the HRV is measured while you're sleeping. Uh, so it's measuring continuously while you're sleeping and you can go down here and you can actually see, this is my graph from last night from 11.37 p.m. to 8.31 a.m. Uh, now keep in mind, this is the time frame that you know I thought I started sleeping till the very end, but I could have awake portions within that. Uh, and you can see there's the average, which is that little dotted line across it and the highest values. I can tap down to see my last seven days of averaging there. Uh, you can see, you know, up until this past weekend, uh, I was continuing to climb over the course of my vacation. And then I had the race there, uh, the night before the race, sorry. So less sleep there. And then I had uh, the day after the race. So that's where you see HRV values tend to climb. There are many things that can impact HRV values from alcohol to workouts, to lack of sleep, to stress, tons and tons of things. The core thing to understand about HRV though, is that it's meant for longer term trending. So just looking at one particular night isn't super helpful. You wanna look at how it looks over a longer period of time, typically in the order of something like a minimum of seven days average, and then up to multiple weeks. In the case of Garmin, you will not see the HRV status, whether that's balanced or not balanced, until after 19 days of wearing it. So that it takes 19 days of data gathering, and then from there, it'll start showing the different points. And then after that, it's gonna be looking up to 90 days of your past status. So the whole idea on this is to be able to look at kind of longer range trending. So in other words, you really should not use a single bad night of HRV status to kind of drive everything. Uh, and the idea behind that is again, like this race scenario, where if you are having poor sleep night before a race, that's totally normal. Doesn't mean you shouldn't race that day, it just means that you had lower HRV values for that particular night. And in fact, you'll see this on the morning report. So each morning when you wake up, it'll say good morning to you. Um, literally, it'll say good morning, you can see it right here. And you can scroll down and you can see your HRV status for the night, your sleep, the weather coming up for the day, uh, any calendar items on there. And it'll kind of walk you through that and show you kind of where you are on the day. And in fact, last Saturday, after seven days on vacation, uh, I managed to actually get so productive, I was unproductive again. So you got higher and higher and higher in balance and eventually you get to the point where things, something might actually be wrong with you. For some people in some situations, when you get a higher HRV value, that actually isn't necessarily a good thing. In my case, it is, it just means I'm more recovered. But because Garmin's data set up until now for me over the last month and a half or whatever the case is, uh, is mostly for lower HRV values. So when it sees me vacationing for a week and finally getting relaxed enough, it's like, 
something's wrong with that dude. Uh, so that's why it kind of popped up and said it's high unbalanced. And then back on this page here, if I look at like last night, for example, I can tap into this. You can see last night HRV was lower than usual and basically tells me it's normal for day-to-day -day fluctuations. So going on back here, there we go, back to this page, we've got the next piece, which is training status. Uh, now this is all focused on the actual workout side of things, in particular, your workouts over a longer period of time. So right now I got the elusive productive status, meaning I've managed to do something right in Garmin's world. Uh, you can see my VO2 max is increasing, my HRV status is balanced, and my acute load is optimal. Acute load means load for the last seven days. Uh, so it's optimal relative to everything else. So if I tap this upper button right there, it basically tells me I'm doing good stuff um, and all is well in my particular training and balanced life. Uh, and if I go down here, so press this button there to go down, you can see my acute load is in the green. That's called a tunnel. So if I tap this, uh, you can see again, over the course of the end of my vacation, I continued to climb. I did work out about every other day or so, uh, but nothing kind of super crazy. And then I had a race yesterday, so my uh, you know acute load starts to incline again or increase again uh, because of that. But I'm just barely staying in the bottom of this green tunnel. Uh, and then as I continue to increase my training over the next couple weeks again, it'll kind of go back up again. And the idea is to stay within the green because if you train too hard, it's not good for you. And if you under train, that's also not good for you. And that's really what the productive is looking at. It's looking at whether or not your training is kind of in that particular tunnel. Now keep in mind that these metrics do take time to kind of flush out. So if you just put this watch on today, you're probably not going to see great metrics there. You really need like many weeks, ideally a month or so of training and ideally a variety variety training, meaning uh, not just all easy runs over the course of maybe your off season, but to have hard workouts and long workouts and short workouts and all that kind of stuff to kind of build up all this data behind the scenes. So if I go back here, uh, you can see there's a load focus. Uh, and this is showing me the different focus areas of aerobic, anaerobic. And if I just tap it again, you can see those uh, labels put up there. Aerobic, high aerobic, and low aerobic. Uh, you can see right now, I'm pretty solidly way over on high aerobic, uh, less so on aerobic or low aerobic there at the bottom there. Uh, and my anaerobic is just right in the edge there. And you can see low aerobic shortage. And this is where if I tap this open, it's starting to look at my race calendar that I'll talk about in just a second here. And you can see I'm in the peak phase of this, uh, where it's trying to you know get me ready for this particular race. And if I go down here, you can see the taper phase. And then you can see the actual race date that I have there, that 16 kilometer race that we'll uh, dive into in just a second. So going on down, you can see the VO2 max. We showed this earlier, the exact same page there. I can tap into this. And you can see based on my running via two max trend, my fitness is increasing uh, and it continues to climb up. I haven't had quite the right amount of blend of workouts to increase my VO2 max numbers here. Uh, and so that's part of it to keep in mind is that how you increase your VO2 max on the watch is partly fitness, but also partly getting the workouts that Garmin likes uh, to judge your VO2 max based on. So you want some nice, long, kind of easy runs, for example, or the same is true for cycling. You want some really high intensity uh, interval workouts and stuff like that. And it's gonna go ahead and increase those values or change those values based on those different categories of workouts. So if you just have easy runs, you probably won't get a great representation of your correct VO2 max. You saw the HRV status earlier, and then here's recovery. This is recovery hours since my workout. In my case, I raced yesterday, so it sees me as relatively high recovery, um, but I am recovering as expected. I can tap this again, and it says my recovery needs are high. Maybe it's easy to take it, a uh, good idea to take it easy today. Uh, so keep in mind, this can decrease relatively quickly faster than that 45 hours or whatever the number is on your particular uh, workout. If you have better sleep or if you have more uh, just a restful day, you'll see it drop a lot faster. And then inversely, if you have poor sleep or a very high stress day, you'll see it probably slow down a little bit. So the clock isn't always exactly this. It just on purpose depends on what you're doing in life, which again, makes sense. If you have a hard day when you're supposed to be recovering, it's gonna go ahead and slow your recovery. And then the most important thing to keep in mind about this is this is until your next hard workout. It doesn't mean any workout. So later on tonight, I'm probably gonna do an easy spin, for example, and then tomorrow I'll kind of dive into a bit more normalcy, uh, but it just means don't go out and do like a hard interval workout today because that's probably not gonna help you very much. So going on back again, we'll back out of this and we'll be down to, we've covered the uh, VO2 max, we covered this, and let's talk about the race pieces. And then from there, we'll dive into sports. Uh, so one of the new features on the 255 and 955 is the ability to schedule races and see those races here on the widgets themselves. You could always create races on Garmin Connect's calendar, but they frankly didn't do much of anything. Now, when you create a race on Garmin Connect Mobile or on the website, uh, you input in not only the race date, but the exact time, the city location, even the course itself, and that's gonna drive all these recommendations 
recommendations. It's going to drive basically a training plan for running a particular in a little bit cycling, but not as much in the cycling depth to go ahead and get you ready for that race. So if you put a marathon in your calendar in like September, for example, and now it's June, it'll go ahead and start creating workouts, dynamically creating those workouts all the way until that uh, race day, and including different build phases and peak and taper and all that kind of stuff. And then at the same time, if you put just a 10K on that race, it'll go ahead and it'll drive towards a 10K workout. So it's going to have workout distances that are appropriate for that particular race distance. Uh, it's all going to be customized to you and based on your particular training load uh, up until that point in time. So if I tap this open right here, uh, this is the race that I've created uh, on July 9th, so about uh, two weeks and five days from now. And I can go down, I can see here is my estimated finish time of that particular race. So uh, 16K is a roughly 10, 11 mile race, uh, and it thinks I'm gonna finish in 114. Again, I haven't really had great runs on this right now to go ahead and drive with that VO2 max, which is what drives this particular estimate. Uh, and so you can see my increased VO2 max of the last you know, couple weeks has improved my race time, but in order to get me my most accurate race time, I would probably have to have better runs to go ahead and drive that VO2 max number up. Go down again, you can see the average temperature on you know, 9 a.m. in Paris is 18 degrees Celsius. The high is 25 and 14 uh, for this particular day of the year. And then this is the course that I've loaded in there. So the Paris 10 miler course, uh, and you can see again, the ascent uh, and descent that are there. Uh, and then you can see a bit of a profile for this. Now, if I click on back there, you'll see down below, race calendar has two events. Uh, and so I've also got a second uh, trail running race that I've set out there for August 20th, and it'll automatically transition from one race to the next race, and it's all dynamic. And this in turn controls what are called daily suggested workouts. So if I tap on back here and go to start a workout, so press the upper right hand button right there, I'm gonna choose the workout sport profiles. So you can see here, I can choose run and hike, track run, treadmill, et cetera. I can go down through all these sport profiles, I can add more, there we go. I'm just gonna kind of scroll through all these here. Uh, these are relatively similar to what we've seen in the past, except now we have more depth on some of the other workout profiles, uh, like for example, the different cycling workouts that have power meter support now. And there we go down at the very bottom. But I'm gonna go back to run to be able to illustrate the point on daily suggested workouts. I tap on run right there, and you see here's today's suggestion. So you can see it's a relatively easy base run. Uh, so 34 minutes at 535 a kilometer. So if I tap down right here, I can see more information about it. The workout's designed to gradually increase my running mileage. Uh, the benefit area, the aerobic area, and then the steps. In this case, it's just one step workout. It'll throw down some seriously crazy interval workouts. In fact, if I go up here to this, I tap up here and start. I can tap do workout. That means to go outside and get ready to do the workout. Or I can click dismiss to say, nah, I'm doing my own thing today. I can click more suggestions. Uh, and you can see these are what the upcoming suggestions are for the uh, daily trajectory workouts. So tomorrow I've got a sprint and then base and then base and then recovery and then a long run and long run and so on. And I think if I put the sprint one here, it'll show me what exactly is going on. There we go. And you can see this is a pretty creative interval workout. So two by three by 15 seconds at 255 a kilometer uh, and then repeat this whole cycle uh, in, in total 44 minutes with some kind of bigger base chunks in between there. Uh, and again, these can get crazy complicated and in a good way, in fact. Uh, it's not just, you know, like just simply a block of saying, hey, this given intensity, just stay there the entire workout. But what's cool is if I go back here into the settings, uh, so I go back, let me just go back, start up again. There we go, run, go down to settings. What you'll see is uh, I can one, turn this feature on and off if I want to, but I can also choose what workout day I want my long workouts to be on. So I can say, hey, I wanna be on Saturday or Sunday or maybe some other combination in the middle of the week. Back when I was training on Ironmans, I actually did my long runs on Tuesday nights because it went ahead and kind of fit in my weekly schedule a bit more. So I can do that and change that right here if I wanted to. And I can also choose what kind of target pace I want or what kind of target I want, sorry. Do I want pace or do I want heart rate? You cannot choose running power right now for this, unfortunately, you just can choose pace or heart rate. Hopefully we'll see that down the road. And then I can also pause training. So if for some reason life gets in the way and this race just simply isn't gonna happen, I can just simply say, you know what, stop asking me about this kind of stuff and just let me pause that training for now. What's worthwhile though, if you scroll all the way to the very, very bottom, you'll see plan overview. And this shows the plan that we saw earlier in terms of my peak phase, uh, getting me up to June 29th, uh, and then my taper phase, again, ahead of that particular race. And this is mostly, not mostly, this is pretty much entirely focused on running races right now. You can put cycling races on there and they'll show up on your calendar, uh, but it won't really do all the depth of this sort of training stuff. It's going to give you workouts that will get you there, but it's not gonna do all these build and taper phases and stuff like that, like you'll see for running. It sounds like that's coming, but it's not quite there today. I don't think we're talking years away, we're probably talking sometime this year. Okay, so now that we're in this particular running area, let's back up a little bit and look at some of the settings. So I just press back a few times to get to run. So I'll just hold this middle button down here and we see running settings. 
And this is where you can change your data screens and data fields. So data screens, tap open to that again, and each one of these is the data fields or data pages that I have with data fields in them. Uh, so I've customized a lot of these, uh, so it's a bit more data fields and data pages, sorry, than you would have on by default. Uh, and you can see this is a running dynamics one, another running dynamics one, uh, this is my running power one. So Garmin 455 and 955 now have native running power, but that does require you to have uh, something like a RD pod that you see right here, this little guy, um, or to have the HRM Try, HRM Pro, HRM Run, HRM something uh, chest straps uh, that do have running dynamic support on them. Uh, hopefully down the road, we'll see have native running power support without requiring anything at all. For example, in the case of Koros and Polar, they can just use the watch on your wrist and it does that automatically. The same as well with Apple now too, and the new Apple Watch, uh, Watch OS 9 coming up this fall. But in Garmin's case, it does still require some sort of external sensor that you clip on yourself. Now it's worthwhile noting in running power, you don't have to use just this particular configuration. You can put running power in any data field that you want or any data page that you want. Uh, it's just a standard data field. But again, you do have to have one of those running power accessories with you to go ahead and drive this. And if I go down again, I can see heart rate. And then these are all just other data pages. In this case, this is power from Strides. So I've actually also got the Stride uh, Connect IQ power app in there. And again, back up the top right there. I can customize any of these though by just tapping this upper right hand button. I can choose the data fields I want. Uh, I can also choose the layout. So if I go back here once, uh, layout, you can see the different layouts you can choose. So just kind of scrolling through some of these right there different layout options, up to six data fields per page that you can see on uh, this particular configuration. And you can customize all the stuff again on the Garmin uh, Connect mobile app. So you can see right here on the screen, some of the different screens there, everything is customizable there. So you can customize it all there as opposed to having to do you know, one by one different things here. The only downside though is you can't uh, basically get copy profiles from an older watch to a newer watch. You kind of have to start fresh again. Hopefully down the road we'll see that. We're seeing that already on Garmin's Edge devices, so maybe we'll see it sometime on the watches as well. So if I back out again one more time, uh, we're back to these fields here, back out again, you can see some of the customization. For example, alerts, I can add alerts based on heart rate, uh, run, walk, pace, time, distance, power, calories, elevation, proximity, cadence. Uh, these are all things, to, if I wanted, for example, heart rate alert, I can set, uh, I want to stay within a given zone zone uh, there. That's different than a structure workout though. A structure workout is something you would download that had different portions of it. Similar to what we saw earlier with the daily suggested workouts. This is more about saying, hey, I want to do a run just in zone four uh, and beep or chirp whenever I go outside of that zone. That's what our alerts are better for. Um, or a run walk alert to say, I want to run walk, sorry, I want to walk time and then run time to repeat kind of forever. Uh, and the same is true for the different other categories here. Going on back here again, you can see laps. Uh, you can set it to be by auto lap or by manual lap. Uh, in the case of auto lap, by distance uh, if you wanted to. And then if I go down here, you can choose the distance. I can also change the lap alert. So for example, every time I press the lap key, I can tell it to show me the lap time and the total time, but I can also change that. I can say, you know what? I wanna know instead of lap time, or sorry, total time, I wanna know my pace. So lap pace field, and then go down to uh, lap pace, and now it'll show me uh, the lap time and the lap pace instead, which is far more useful than total time in, in most cases anyways. So clicking on back here, metronome, auto pause, auto climb, most of these are relatively self-explanatory. In the case of auto climb, what auto climb allows you to do is to have a different data page when you're climbing. So it detects when you're going up a hill based on a given ascent rate, and then from there, it shows an extra data page. It maybe has some more altitude related bits on it uh, that you can enable right there. It's different than Climb Pro. That's one core difference between the 255 and the 955 here is the 955 has Climb Pro, which will show you the upcoming climbs and exact gradients on those climbs on your particular course uh, versus this one doesn't. Uh, and I find that super, super valuable. It's also interesting something that the 745 does have. Uh, the 745 price-wise though, kind of sits in between the two of these. And it's really a bit of an older watch now, which sounds strange to be only like a year and three quarters old, but the reality is that there's a different generation of watch. I wouldn't probably recommend buying the 745 now. I would probably recommend sticking with either the 255 at 349 to 400 bucks or jumping up the extra 100 bucks or so to the 955 as opposed to going to 745. Again, just kind of in a word spot these sort of days these sort of days, these days. Anyways, going on back here, uh, you've got training. Training is where you can go ahead and add uh, structural workouts or do structural workouts. You can create interval workouts on the unit itself. You can do pace pro plans. Pace pro plans are great for pacing a race. Uh, it's gonna give you exact splits throughout that particular race. You can do a lactate threshold guided test if you wanna hurt a bit. Uh, you can set a target. Race and activity, that means racing a past activity. Say you'd like ran Central Park every single week and you wanted every Friday to do a race against it, you could do that by racing your past activity. Uh, and the training calendar shows us on the particular training calendar. 
clicking on back right here, navigation. This allows you to navigate a course. So I'm gonna just choose a course right here. Uh, let's see, what do I got that's kind of fun in this particular list? Um, that's a cycling course, but we'll just choose that. Choose that right there. There we go. This is up Montbon 2. Uh, from a cycling standpoint, you can see that's the course, uh, you know, like little map profile there. There's no mapping on the 255 though, uh, but it just gives you breadcrumb trail style uh, course routing. And you can see do course, pace pro, map, do course in reverse. Look at the elevation plot. So you can see, there you go, pretty straightforward. It goes up, but it goes down again. And I got some flat section after that as part of this loop. I'm gonna go back again. Uh, and then I go in down to the top and do course. And if I were to load this particular course up, there we go. And then crack into the data fields. So I'm gonna eventually see here on one of these, you'll see, and if I was out in the course, this would then show me where I am on the course. Uh, and you would also see the up ahead. Uh, these are the waypoints that you define in there. So in my case, I defined one where to get some blueberry pie. And then I've got the summit and the cafe stop, uh, and then another town and so on. Uh, and these are called up ahead. This is part of Garmin's up ahead feature. that allows you to specify not just the waypoints, but little icons for them. And then it shows you how long until you get to those given waypoints. Now it's worthwhile talking briefly about multi-band configuration. So in the case of the 255 and 955, they added in the new multi-band GPS or dual frequency GPS or technically called GNSS, uh, which is basically a dual frequency satellite system. So in the past, when you connect to satellite systems, you connect to roughly about 20 or so satellites uh, and that would give you reasonably good accuracy. But with dual frequency uh, GNS systems, you're connecting essentially just two different frequencies of satellites and getting upwards of 60 different satellites. Now the downside of that is that you get a pretty big battery hit. It roughly halves your battery life. Uh, but unless you're going out and doing super long runs, like if you're going out and doing a 30 hour workout or something like that, it probably won't matter to most people. So for me personally, I'm going to take what is a significant leap up in GPS accuracy over necessarily longer battery life. Uh, and you can check this on the given sport profile by opening it up and then holding in again to go to the settings, looking at run settings and going all the way down here to GPS. And you'll see right there, all plus multi-band. So Garmin calls it multi-band, other companies call it dual frequency, it's all the same sort of thing. And you can see the different settings here. There's GPS only, which is pretty good. And if I was just running out in the cow pastures uh, here in the Netherlands, I would probably just use GPS only and it's gonna be totally fine. And then the next step up is all systems. Uh, this basically is what you would have had in the past. So it's GPS plus GLONASS plus Galileo, et cetera, five different systems. And it's gonna use one of those based on whatever the best system is. And so that's also generally very, very good. In fact, I did a test in New York City where I compared all systems to multi-band on two separate uh, Phoenix 7 watches. So the same chipset that's used here in the 255, and they were almost indistinguishable. It was so close, you could barely tell in only a handful of cases. Even in middle Manhattan, it was very, very similar. But if you really wanna step it up, if you're up in the mountains, if you're again in the middle of the city, then all plus multi-band is kind of like the, the holy grail, if you will, of GPS accuracy, but there is definitely a hit there. What's worthwhile noting though, is that UltraTrack, despite having like the ultra name, thinking it's the best thing out there, is actually the worst GPS accuracy. It trades GPS accuracy for significantly longer battery life. So if you were doing a hike in the mountains for like a couple weeks, uh, you would probably want this. And it probably wouldn't quite last a couple weeks unless you didn't hike very much every day. But the point being, this basically only takes samples once every two minutes or so. Uh, and so in that case, you get way less GPS samples, but you get way, way longer battery life. The point being though, don't use that unless you really, really have to. And now speaking of battery life, one of the things you can do if you really need to extend your battery life is to turn on battery saver. So middle button again, go on down here, keep on going all the way down until you see the very, very bottom power manager. Tap on that and you see battery saver. Uh, so if I enable this right now, uh, this will go from 12 days to 64 days of battery life. But you can see all the things it's gonna disable. It's gonna put the watch into a low power mode, it's gonna disable music, disable the phone, disable Wi-Fi, disable the optical heart rate, disable pulse ox, turn the brightness to low and activity tracking disabled. Now again, for some people, depending on what you're doing, you may not care about any of this stuff. You just wanna simply have like the watch show you the time. That's basically all it's gonna do here is show you the time. But when you do that, you get that 64 days. Versus if I turn this off, I'm back to 12 days based on my current battery life uh, and the fact that it's, I think it was 80% earlier. Remember if I just hold this down there, 85% battery life. So you get about 14 or so days, uh, again, on the full-sized watch here, and this is the music edition uh, based on that. And that's just a standby battery life. So let's round things out now by talking about contactless payments as well as music. So you can load your credit cards onto your Garmin watch, assuming your bank supports it. And I say your bank because in the case of Garmin Pay, it's a bank by bank system. It's not just all Visa cards or all Amex cards or all MasterCards or whatever the case is. It's if your particular bank behind your credit card supports that. Uh, so in the US, 
the vast majority of the major banks that support credit cards do actually support that, things like Chase and others. Uh, here in Europe, it's a bit more kind of wobbly. So my Dutch bank does not support it, nor does my French bank account. So neither of those are supported, but other Dutch banks and other French banks are supported. Point being, Garmin has an entire page dedicated to looking up whether or not your bank is supported. Anyways, once your card is loaded, it only takes a couple seconds, you can access it by pressing the upper left hand button, and you can see the wallet right there. When you tap on that, you enter your passcode in, which is secret, obviously. And then you put right there, and I take my card reader right here, turn on my payment. If I was at just a merchant of some sort, you can see that there, and I just put it close to it, tap, and there we go. Please wait, and it'll show confirmation here, and I'm done. It's as simple as that. Uh, the main thing I would use this for is just like if you knew certain shops or certain places, certain stores supported contactless payment, supported Garmin Pay, it's pretty handy for that, like after a run, just to get a drink or ice cream or whatever the case may be, and maybe your local convenience store or something like that. So the last piece here is music support. Uh, in this case, that does require the 255 Music Edition, either on the 255S or 255 regular one, uh, and then it does require some sort of Bluetooth headphones. Uh, they don't actually have to be headphones, they can be a Bluetooth speaker, any sort of Bluetooth audio device, even your car if you wanted to pair it to that. Uh, so in my case, I already pre-paired it. Uh, the way that works, you go into sensors, so it can hold us down right there, go on down to sensors right there, uh, and I can add a Bluetooth audio device. In fact, we didn't talk about sensors earlier, so now's a good time to mention that. So I can add all sorts of sensor types in here. If I click on Add New, you can see e-bike, extended display, external heart rate, foot pod, headphones, lights. These are cycling lights, by the way. Uh, cycling power meters, cycling radars, uh, RD pod, which is for the running dynamics pod, the one I showed right there, that little guy. Uh, smart trainers, speed and cane sensor for cycling, Tempe for temperature sensor, Verb for Garmin's action camera they discontinued years ago, uh, but it's still there, and back up to headphones are right there. Now, in my case, I've already added it to the list along with many other sensors. So you see the HRM Pro strap there, power, these are all cycling power meters I have, uh, trainers, RD pod, and there's my power beats right there. So if I go ahead and take these out, they should go ahead and turn on in just a second. So you'll see them uh, searching and then I'll connect up to them. See, I think they're powered on. This should be at this point. I can speed that up by clicking connect. There we go, and now it is connected. So click on back here. I'm gonna get all the way back to this right there, and I'm gonna go down to music. Uh, and in my case, I've got Spotify already loaded on it. So Spotify is one of a few different music apps that Garmin supports, including Amazon Music, so you can download anything from Amazon Music onto your watch uh, as well. Spotify and Deezer, um, and you can also put your own music on it too. Now the main thing though here is this is downloading music via Wi-Fi onto your watch. You do not need your phone at all. You can take this phone and throw it in the river, uh, and you can play the music just fine between the watch and the headphones. So you do have to check in every 30 days or so. Uh, so if you did throw this in the river, you got 30 days to fix this because uh, it won't complete the check-in without it. Uh, so in this case, I go and I can add music. So this is Spotify in my case. So I click on playlist and it'll show me all the playlists that I have in my Spotify account. Um, or I can go to ones that are kind of predefined for workouts. So this is my kids um, like dance playlist where they just want to have fun dancing around. Uh, this is the Peloton one. This is the chill one and so on. And I can choose any of these and I can just choose to download it by clicking add like this, and I'll go off and search for the Wi-Fi networks. Uh, so I have multiple Wi-Fi networks loaded in here, ones for home and office and uh, my mobile hotspot, etc. And you can see it starts to sync automatically. Uh, now the signal there at the bottom will show you the signal strength. It is reasonably important to have good signal strength for this, and it's not super fast in the grand scheme of things. You can see right here at 3%, there's only 14 tracks in this, so it takes a little bit of time. But what's cool though is that once you have a bigger Spotify playlist downloaded, you can sync the updates to it relatively quickly. Uh, it does that anytime you plug it in. So if I were to put this watch on a charger for an hour or something like that, in the background, it's gonna go ahead and sync those updates to it. It also resets that 30 day clock, which is pretty handy. Uh, so I'm gonna cancel out of this so we don't have to wait here for this entire thing. But you can see, if I go back here again, I've got two tracks already downloaded, so I can listen to those two tracks now. I can go to the pizza making playlist, so I can crack this open. In fact, if I were to go ahead and turn the volume right here, there we go, from the watch itself. Pizza making time. Uh, so, you can also, let me just pause this here. Um, go back and back again. Pause that right there. I can play and skip tracks in the bottom there. Uh, I can control other things. That's really loud. There we go. Pause that again. Uh, I don't want to get like a YouTube copyright ban there. So uh, just so you can kind of see that. Uh, and again, I can also change my playlist as well. Change my music providers. I can have multiple headphones stored. I can choose whether it's stereo or mono for the audio. Uh, not a ton of options in here. 
Uh, you can't do things like favorite a given song, but it's just about playing the, the playlist that you have. Everything is playlist driven. So it's all about choosing a playlist and going off and playing it. Uh, and it works pretty well for me. I think we've seen Garmin over the last few years since an introduction to the first device have very good connectivity between all the headphones that I try. Haven't had any problems at all, no matter which wrist I'm wearing it on or you know running or walking. Uh, all those problems of like years past where if you were to put your hand down, they would stop. Uh, I have no problems with any of that. I even use it around the studio here sometimes, just playing from this, just for the sake of it, just because I can, I guess. So at this point, I think we've covered everything there is to cover on the Forerunner 255. Hopefully you found this video interesting or useful. If so, go ahead and like that like button at the bottom there, or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. With that, have a good one.